We're going to go through a whole chapter of Hebrews today, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Oh, God is good. God is good. God is good. Hey, so I do want to remind everyone that we have that spiritual gifts assessment. We have a spiritual gifts assessment. A free test takes like 15 minutes to do. It's really good, and it highlights your spiritual gifts. And we're going to use that as part of the conference. Um, It's not a requirement to do it before the conference, but it might be helpful for the Saturday session, the the afternoon session, when we're going to break out into different uh, workshops. We're going to have a a couple different things going on. So that's online. That's there's a button to click to take the test. It gives you instructions uh, on the Awake Arise Advance, the triple A gathering part of the page, the event page. Okay, well, it's good to be back. I'm just about over the jet lag from California. I was in California this week. It was very quick. It was a whirlwind, and um, I had another postponement of my flight when I got to the airport. There was an overflow, and they, did, they didn't have a seat for me on the flight, even though I paid for a ticket. I guess they do that. But they offered me some money, and they put me on a flight that was only about an hour and 45 minutes later. So I walked away with 300 bucks. It paid for all my expenses on the trip, and I still got there the same day I wanted to. So glory. Nick prayed for upgrades for me. So I'll receive that as that, that upgrade, you know. Um, but I had a really good time with my good friend, Dylan DeMarsico, uh, who's a pastor at a church, a large church in California, a beautiful church. Got to sit in on one of their staff meetings, got to join him for this recovery group that his wife just started. I won't share that whole story again, but I've been talking about that leading up to this trip where we've been, uh, we're, we're going to use the um, seven facets curriculum for his church and their recovery group. And, uh, and so I got to be there to introduce it on the opening week, which was not planned. That wasn't planned. I just was sent there. It was a birthday gift from my dear wife, Kelly. She blessed me with this trip, and, and um, there you are, love. Thank you. And, uh, but had no idea that they would also be doing this recovery meeting where I would be able to introduce the curriculum on the first week <laughs> that they started it. Um, so that was a birthday gift. That was a double portion of a birthday gift. Um, so yeah, there was, there was a lot more I'll share as God leads. Um, but I want to stay focused this morning. I want to get into Hebrews and, um, yeah, we're going to actually go through a good portion of the book of Hebrews today. So, uh, I'm excited about this. There's a lot in the end of chapter seven and mostly chapter eight we're going to be in today. Um, we're going to spend more time in Genesis chapter 15 than we will even in Hebrews. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll make it by the grace of God. Been asking for a lot of grace because I've been very tired and had some wonderful people pray for me this week, particularly for the message. And so, um, whatever good comes out of this, you can thank the intercessors in the church because, um, I did not have it in me only two days ago, uh, to prepare this today. Um, so, um, let me pray, and then I want to show you a quick scripture in the book of Jeremiah to get us started. Lord, we ask right now in, in just your amazing friendship with us, God, that you would speak to us through your word and walk us through your word as a friend does, as one who loves to walk in the cool of the day. In the Garden of Eden, Lord, you set the plan that you had in motion. You desire to walk with us, to be with us, to speak to us as a friend. May you lead us through your word. Holy Spirit, friend of all friends, I ask that you would lead us and guide us in your word today. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we receive it. Amen. Okay. So... Turn your attention for a moment to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 22. Before we pick up in Hebrews 7, 22, which is just a coincidence, the numbers there. 
But Jeremiah 7.22 is a very problematic verse. It says, this is God speaking through the prophet. He says, for I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. I don't know if any of you are aware of why this is problematic. But for anybody who's read the Bible, particularly the book of Exodus, when God led the people out of Egypt, he talked to them a lot about sacrifices and burnt offerings. They got a lot of instructions about burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this says, Jeremiah, who is rebuking the nation, he says, I did not speak to your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Okay, I'm just going to leave you in the tension of that, and we will get back to it, okay? I'm just going to put that out there. You can put that in your back pocket. Um, I want to talk primarily today about the word covenant. Everybody say covenant. Covenant is a, a very important word in the Bible. Um, I mean, it is the Bible, okay? The words testament can really be translated as covenant. So our Bible is split into an old covenant and a new covenant. And it's part of why it's a double-edged sword, because the old covenant is described by Paul as, as a, a, a vehicle that brings death, whereas the new covenant brings life. And so even the scripture itself is this double-edged sword of life and death, and we have to rightly divide that word. And so Jesus in Hebrews, let's go to 722 in Hebrews. It says this, after we talk about Melchizedek, we talked about the order of Aaron versus the order of Melchizedek. These are two priestly systems and they correspond to the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Anyway, it says this. So all of this, everything we've talked about magnifies the truth that we have a superior covenant with God than what they experienced in the Old Testament. For Jesus himself is its guarantor. Okay. So Jesus begins to be introduced to us as the high priest of a new covenant, a superior covenant. And... Um, We've spent a lot of time understanding the role of the high priest, the whole priestly order. This morning, I want to look at the all-important concept of a covenant, what a covenant is. And to do that, we're going to go back to the book of Genesis. Just like we did to understand Melchizedek, we had to go back to a story in Genesis 14 to get the full picture of what Melchizedek was about. And we saw so much glory, so much prophetic beauty in Genesis 14. Now we're going to go to Genesis 15. It's amazing. In Genesis 14 and 15, you get all of this understanding of what's happening in this part of Hebrews. They go together beautifully. And in Genesis 15, we're going to see a covenant happening um, as it was back in that day. And, um, and it involves Abraham, just like we saw with Melchizedek and his wars with the kings of darkness. Um, when we translated their names, um, where Melchizedek showed up. Now we're going to see Abraham alone with God. Okay. Um, Genesis 15 is where we see these two parties entering into this concept. Okay. And this idea of a covenant essentially uh, was and is an alliance. A covenant is an alliance or it's a treaty between two parties, okay? So very often this would be two nations or two tribes that entered into a covenant, or it could have been two leaders of a community. A covenant can also happen in an alliance between two people, two families, as in a man and a woman in marriage, which is a covenant. And a covenant, no matter what form it takes or who's involved, always involves promises from each party, vows, right, that they would fulfill certain expectations. So typically in a covenant, there is a greater party and a lesser party. 
and the greater party promises to protect and bless the weaker party, and in return, the weaker party uh, promises to fulfill certain responsibilities on their ends. So that's just a general sketch of the word. Now, what the word actually means, it comes from two root words. Covenant comes from two words that come together to give us, in the Hebrew, the word for covenant. The two words are cut, which is why people would cut a covenant. And it's also, it also comes from the word eat. So the word cut and eat come together to form this word covenant. I'm going to start with the cut part of this. Because in ancient times, and I've, I've heard... I believe this is true, that this still happens in certain parts of the world today. Um, What what it involves is sacrificial animals are taken, presented, and they're killed in this ceremony. And their bodies are cut in two. So they're cut right in half, and they're spread across from each other, and usually multiple animals are involved, and it forms this aisle that you'd have to walk down. So when the agreements get made, right, the promises, the vows, when they're spoken and they're settled, this is what would happen. The first party, the greater party, would walk through the aisle. And then the other party, in agreement and in making their promise, they would walk down that aisle as well. And what this act communicated in very graphic, kind of gory terms, is that if one party broke their agreement, then they could be killed and chopped up just like those animals. This was a serious ceremony. And it was binding. And it carried just as much weight, if not probably a lot more, than a modern contract involving attorneys and a judge. So, yeah, they would walk down the aisle and they would say, if I break my promise, you can do to me what I'm doing right now. You can trample on my body. Yeah. That's a covenant. Now... The word eat is in there as well because what would happen in these covenant ceremonies is that they would usually always end with a meal together. So after they walk through the aisle, they would then sit down and eat at a table, which would be the sign of their friendship or their loyalty and their newfound alliance and unity together. Okay, so a covenant was a meal and a cutting. And already, for those of you with eyes to see, you can kind of see how this points to the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated with a meal right before he was cut, pierced, and trampled on our behalf. Okay. But I want to focus on Genesis 15 before we get to that, okay? I'm sorry, Genesis 15. Um, Abraham, he receives a promise from God. Let me show it to you. Verses 5 and 6. And he, God, took Abraham outside and said, Now, look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to even count them. And God said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then Abraham believed in the Lord, And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Okay, so God makes this promise to Abraham who does not have a child. His name is actually still Abram at this point. And and God is saying, look, you're not only going to have a child, but this is how many descendants you're going to have. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Look up at the stars. And this is before light pollution, right? This was, this was a lot, like unimaginable. If you've been in a, I, I, I used to go vacationing in the panhandle of Texas. I had a great grandfather, Father Abraham. No, his name was Woody. Um, his name was Woody, actually. 
and um, great granddad Woody, and he owned 500 acres in the panhandle of Texas. And I would go out and I'd look at the stars. And I mean, I was little. This was before Starlink. This is before satellites were everywhere. And I could see these stars moving all across the place. And I'm like, what is that? And I was told, no, that's a, those, are, those are satellites. It was amazing. So anyway, he has a moment like this with God. God says, I want you to look out at those stars. That's what I'm going to do through you, <laughs> Abram. And it's incredible. And the scriptures say that, that Abraham just believed and God counted it as righteousness for him. Righteousness means you are blessed, you are forgiven, you're covered, you're good, everything's great if you're righteous. He counted it as complete, perfect righteousness just because he believed. And that verse becomes like one of the most important foundational concepts of the entire Bible where we learn how it's through simple faith in God, trusting him, that we are declared righteous, right? Um, Okay, however... When you keep reading the story, you do see Abraham wavering. Um, And the reason is because the story is really not about Abraham's faith. It's really about God's faithfulness. And that'll become clear. Okay, so God makes this promise. They go on a midnight stroll looking at the stars. Abraham believes, but... He goes on to ask God for a guarantee. Now, you can read this yourself. I'm going to paraphrase a lot of the the chapter. But he asks God for a guarantee because he lives in this world where if one party makes a really big promise, an amazing promise, a blessing, um, you don't just take their word for it. You ask for some kind of contract. You ask for something to be done that's going to say, this is really going to happen with serious promises and oaths attached to it and consequences if those oaths are broken. And so this is why they had covenants in the world at that time because that would seal the deal on a promise. What's amazing is that God submits himself to Abraham's fallen system. This fallen world of covenants and contracts based on fear, based on distrust. God says to Abraham, okay, go get the animals. Go get the animals. Tells them which animals to get. Says, we're going to cut a covenant together, Abram. Now, at this point, I could imagine Abraham is like, oh, what did I get myself into? Because you got to remember, you like, you have a part to play. You have to fulfill certain things on your end. And you're interacting with this perfect God. You're going to have to live a perfect life. You're going to have to be righteous. Like you're, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to live at a higher standard. So I'm sure some, some terror came over him, and it actually talks about terror and great darkness coming over him. Um, but what I want to focus on here with you guys, and I want to build on this a lot this morning, is this idea that, that before he incarnated himself into the world through Jesus fully, God was already incarnating himself into our fallen world in these Old Testament times. He was, he was entering kind of our matrix built on fear. So God did not initiate this idea of a bloody sacrificial covenant. This was not God's idea. We made up covenants because we needed surefire ways to ensure protection and establish relationship in a divided, babbling world. And so covenants, again, with their serious threats of punishment, enable people to coexist in the midst of suspicion and selfishness. We still rely on systems of, of uh, courts, of law, you know, for this same purpose, right? Because we live in a world 
filled with distrust. So God entered into the mess. But what I want to point you to this morning is that God didn't enter into the mess to affirm our ways of interacting with each other, our systems. He entered into it in order to destroy it from the inside out. And we're going to see a glimmer of this in this first covenant with Abraham and his children. And this, my friends, is also a little bit why I believe Jeremiah said what he did. That this really wasn't me. This didn't come from my heart, this whole thing about burnt offerings and sacrifices. This was not my idea. It was almost like God was saying, okay, I will submit to your ways and I will give you direction about these things. We'll work with this temporarily and I'll show you a good way to do it, including a good way to handle the animals. You know, the Jewish people actually sacrificed animals in the most humane and and quick ways compared to other cults and religions of the world back then. There was a lot of even protections for animals and even for uh, women and slaves and other parts of the world that that were so far from uh, justice and equality in these things, the Jewish law provided a lot of amazing, what they would have called back then, progressive ways of handling the earth and one another. Anyway, God was like, okay, I'll come in. I'll give you some direction. But I believe it's kind of like this. It's like God saying, this, this is like me being a surgeon, putting my hands into the disease in order to remove it from the sick body of humanity. And so this, this is what we're going to see with this first covenant with Abraham in Genesis. The ultimate plan of God is going to shine through, okay? Everybody with me? We're going we're gonna to look at this story now. Abraham hears this word from God after he asks, like, how can I get a guarantee on your word? You just showed me the stars. I want to know. God tells him, okay, get these animals, make an aisle. He does it. He lays them out. And he knows, okay, somehow the eternal invisible God is going to walk down this aisle. God is going to make a covenant promise here. And he's you know, the anxiety is building because he's like, and I'm going to have to follow. <laughs> I'm after he makes his promises in the greater party, because God in that case is very obviously the greater party. Me as the lesser party, I'm going to have to make my promises and I'm going to walk down the aisle as well. That's what you do with covenants. So this was a terrifying thing to Abraham, but he went through with it. He went through with preparing the aisle. Now, Before things could go any further, it says that a deep sleep fell upon him. I'll show you this verse, verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Abraham is essentially immobilized. He is put to rest, literally. And I think in that moment already, the gospel's shining through and we're seeing his inability, our inability to fulfill any side of our deal, any part of our end of the covenant to secure God's promises somehow. We're unable to guarantee our worthiness in this covenant relationship. And it's interesting that this occurs, it says, as the sun was going down. Because the setting sun, see, we're reading Christ into everything in Scripture. And and God spoke the Scriptures, and he also spoke creation. And in creation, you can read Christ in creation. And in the setting sun, there is a parable every day of Christ's death. The Son of God who moved out of view, just like the sun as it descends in the west and darkness comes. Christ, the Son, 
was crucified and went into the grave and the light was extinguished. And yet, like the dawn, he arose in glory. And every single day, every night, the sun is heralding the gospel to humanity. We're surrounded by the gospel. (laughs) Okay, so anyway, Abraham... Abram is put to rest, and he is unable to walk through the covenant aisle, it seems. So instead, he kind of is in this half-asleep dream state. And he's still able to see what's going on, and he looks at the aisle in front of him that he's laid out outside, wherever his tent is set up, wherever this happens. And suddenly, he sees something strange happen. I'll read this verse as well, verse 17. It came about that when the sun had set, brings that up again, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. The pieces are the pieces of cut animals. So Abraham looks... And he sees these two objects going through the aisle. First, he sees a furnace, a smoking oven, an object marked by fire. And in understanding symbolism, understanding how God speaks throughout the Old Testament, fire becomes a very clear, clear image of God himself. It's how he would reveal himself to Moses in the bush. He's a consuming fire. So Abraham would know very quickly what this is about. He's seeing a prophetic image of the invisible, eternal God walking through the aisle. And God saying, okay, these are my promises, and I will confirm the covenant. And um, I guarantee you today that this will happen. And if it doesn't, may I be cut apart like these animals. It's what God was saying in that moment of a furnace blazing down the path. Now, that would then be Abraham's turn. It would be Abraham's turn then to, okay, wake up, get up, stand to attention, and walk down the aisle. But before he could even get close to that, there's a second symbol of fire that appears. And in this incredible and mysterious scene, we see God himself walk through the aisle twice. In other words, okay, God is communicating something unbelievable. He's saying, I will fulfill my end of the agreement. And I will fulfill your end of the agreement. And if you break your promise, if you are unfaithful to me, I will suffer the consequences. I will let myself be cut down. If you break your end of the agreement, you can tear me apart like these poor sacrificial animals who constantly bear the weight of your ceaseless guilt and shame and fear. As the sun sets, the light of the gospel breaks loose. (laughs) And remember, remember something for those who were here last week or the week before. This, This happens right on the heels of a guy named the King of Righteousness showing up with bread and wine. Oh, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. God was speaking something here that that wouldn't be fully clear for another 2,000 years in the appearing of Jesus. But he was sending a message to the world. He was, big time, right at the beginning. He was sending a message that even though he was entering into our mess, he wasn't coming to affirm our way of doing things, our covenants and contracts and sacrifices. He was coming to end them. And that would happen in the form of something called a new covenant. 
Yes, and I can't, t- I can't wait to tell you about the word new, but we got to just talk about one other thing first. Um, we got to talk about Mount Sinai, because I know the question with this is like, well, all right, God did this amazing thing with Abraham, right? But then, all right, Abraham does have a family. They grow, they become the nation of Israel, and then they enter into a covenant with God at a place called Mount Sinai. Sinai, right? And in this case, it's very different. In that case, both parties walk down the aisle together. They 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 make their vows. The Israelites' vows are summed up in ten statements. We call them the Ten Commandments. They're chiseled into stone. They're put into a box. That box is called the Ark of the Covenant. And it's also called the Ark of the Testimony, and it says this is going to testify against you if you ever break your vow. You have to fulfill your vow, and me as the greater party, if if you fulfill your vow, I will fulfill my vow, which is to bless you, protect you, and cover you, pour out my righteousness over you. I'll do all of this. But you're going to walk through your aisle this time. And there was blood, and there were animals, and there were all those things. At Mount Sinai. So the question is, okay, is God going back on what he did with Abraham? Or maybe is something deeper going on here? Well, we're not done with Genesis just yet. Genesis 15, amazing story. God giving this covenant to Abraham. Read it yourself. Go back to that story. It's beautiful. Maybe all you need to hear today. But after that story. Of, this, of the two images of fire walking down Abraham's covenantal line. Um, something tragic occurs. In the next verse, we put a new chapter on it, but it was actually the very next line after God affirms his promise. Look at this, Genesis 16, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Sarai, who would become Sarah, Abram would become Abraham, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. This is after the promise was made. Some time has passed. Um, She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, now, behold, look, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. He promised it would happen but he's preventing it from happening. You hear the accusation in those words? Please go into my maid. And this is, this is so sad what distrust drives us to. As you imagine the pain in her heart. Please go into my maid. Because you, you gotta, especially in that culture, you have to understand, you don't have an heir of your own to inherit your, your domain, your land, your property, and it, it goes to someone else. There were serious laws of the land. You needed to have your own child to inherit. Anyway, she says to him, this is what we're going to do. Go into my maid, Hagar. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So God just made this amazing promise to Abraham about a child. Doesn't materialize right away. So they devise their own way to help God out. And and to put it bluntly, they're they're still living in this worldly mindset, this system, this broken path that all the world has traversed, where there's fear and hopelessness and distrust. And so not even the covenant was enough for them they take matters into their own hands abraham goes on to have a child with hagar and that child becomes a major thorn in the flesh of their family for countless generations now i will say i always like to point this out when we get to hagar that it's amazing in god's this is a side note in in god's sovereign grace his beauty god loved Ishmael. You understand that? The the person, Ishmael, and the person, Hagar, God tells Hagar at one point, I see you in your sadness. Like, and I'm going to bless your son. I'm going to protect him. 
God still blesses in his goodness. He blesses this child and Hagar and, um, and he loves them and he loves their, pro- their, their progen- progeny, their descendants. But that doesn't change the fact, okay, that the decision Abraham made was wrong. That is the deeper problem. It's unbelief. It's distrust. It's the reason we create covenants in the first place. And it's so ironic because Abraham is called the man of faith. Isn't that so gracious of God to do in the New Testament? It's how he's going to do it for our whole lives, trust me. He's just going to speak our true identity over us in the age to come. How he really sees us. But really, in the natural, Abraham, he did waver. Because it wasn't really about his faith. It was about God's faithfulness. It's about God's faithfulness. So what's incredible is that God still fulfills his promise. Despite what he just did with Agar, the violation that was on many levels, God still goes forward with what he promised he would do. He covers Abraham's weaknesses He gives Abraham and Sarah a son by the supernatural power of the Spirit. And through this son, Isaac, God blesses him and he ultimately would bless the rest of the world. But this story with Hagar is revealing a deeper problem. And the reason I I took you all into this story and what happens is because um, this speaks to our issues of distrust. And... And, and distrust leads us to do things incorrectly outside of God's will, outside of a place of rest and love and hope and all of that. And when you get to the book of Galatians, I wanted to put it up here, but I didn't want to like overwhelm you all with scriptures this morning. But I have it in the notes, Galatians chapter 4. Paul says there's, there's these two covenants, and he compares the old covenant. This would have been so offensive to Jewish people, his Jewish brothers and sisters that he wrote this to, Paul. But he says that, that old covenant with Moses at Sinai, I compare it to Hagar. That's actually a covenant that is based on fear and produces slaves. Fear and distrust will always lead you into slavery. Thinking you, you can fulfill this on your own and do it all on your own because you don't trust me to do it. Because you don't know that I'm good. You don't know that I'm really good and I really have your best intentions in mind. I have a beautiful plan for you. Because you don't trust it, you want to do things on your own. You want a law to follow. You want a prescription. You want the steps to take so you can take care of of yourself because you don't trust me to do it, really. That's what's really going on at Sinai. So even though God enters into that covenant, what would become known as the old covenant, even then his plan was still to blow it all up and to bring a new covenant. Okay, so now we can talk about the word new. So now we're going to move into the New Testament where the book of Hebrews in chapter 8 begins to talk about this new covenant that Jesus came to bring. He's the high priest of the new covenant, right? So there's two words for the word new. We translate it new in our Bible, in the Greek language I'm talking about now. So you might see the word new in your Bible, but you don't know if it's one of two totally different words in the language it was written in. In the Greek, there's two words for new. One is neos. Everybody say neos. Neos. The other is Kainos. Kainos. Okay. Neos means new in respect to time. So if I, it's it's having an old thing and then getting a new version of it. Newer. Okay. I'll, I'll explain more in a little bit. Kainos. Kainos, the definition for that is something that is new in quality and substance. Something of a totally different nature. So the example I have here is like if I get a Neos car, 
okay? What that means is that I'm just getting a newer model. I'm getting a newer model of the same vehicle I've been driving. And it might have some upgrades to it. You know, it might have some new features, but overall, it's the same experience. It's new in respect to time. It's the same car, but it's, it's newer off the lot, made newer in time. Does that make sense? Okay, if I say that I am getting a Kynos vehicle, that means that I was driving some kind of sedan, and I got myself a vehicle that flies, got myself like a mini Elon Musk spaceship cyber truck thing. Like I got, I got something of a totally different nature, something new. That's Kynos new. When the Bible talks about the new covenant, it's the Kynos covenant. It is a totally different covenant in quality, in substance, everything about it. And in Hebrews 8, 6, it says this covenant is much better than what came before. Can we go back to Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 6? Okay, look at this with me for a moment. Take a breath here. Now, the main point, he's finally getting to the main point. I feel like I'm in good company. We're finally getting to the main point of Hebrews today. (laughs) Okay, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Goes on to say, now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. So Jesus has come. This is the main point. He is the high priest. He's the one we've been waiting for. He is the king of righteousness that Melchizedek pointed to. And he's come to bring this new covenant, and here it's called a better covenant. And that word for better means something that is more excellent, more beautiful, more advantageous, and nobler. He's the mediator of a more beautiful, a more incredible covenant. And this covenant is the best thing to hit the planet. It is the best thing, and it's better than all of our ways, everything we try to do to make life work. And to discover this covenant is to discover true rest for your soul. That's, that's the main point. So I want to read to you what he does here in Hebrews 8. He, he, he then pulls out of his back pocket something. He's just slicing and dicing the writer to the Hebrews. And he's like, okay, now I want to show you in the words of your old covenant, I want to show you the prophecy that Jeremiah gave about a new covenant. So we're going to take just a minute here to read through about six verses, long verses, starting in verse 7 of Hebrews 8. And he, he, he has an introductory statement to this. And then he's going to quote Jeremiah chapter 31. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament. Beautiful chapter in the Bible. Uh, but before he does that, he says this, For if that first covenant had been faultless, without problems, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. But finding fault with them, he says, Behold, these are the words of Jeremiah in the Old Testament time, Days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a kinos covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Man, what was Abraham doing when he was going into his Egyptian maid? He was going back to Egypt, back to worldly thinking. The day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Didn't care for them in that 
in that realm, in that Egyptian worldly thinking. Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, know the Lord, you should know God. For they will all know me, from the least to the greatest. It's a way of saying from the poorest to the richest. From the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their iniquities. And I will remember their sins no more. And then he stops and he gives this concluding thought in chapter 8. He says, uh, when he said a new covenant... He has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And that was a warning. The book of Hebrews was written in the mid-60s AD. And in just a few years, literally the whole temple system, the sacrifices, the high priest was going to get destroyed. In 70 AD, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, to this day there has not been a high priest in Israel. There has been. He's in heaven at the right hand of God. This was a warning. It's ready to disappear. So wake up to grace because your religious ways are not going to cut it. The religious system is not going to make it through the days ahead. Because it's built on distrust. It's built on the knowledge that I'm not good. So... Just a couple quick thoughts on the Kainos Covenant, and then we'll, we'll pray. We'll end this just to extract from Jeremiah's words. First of all, I love what it says about the law in the heart. In this covenant, we find that the law is not something we have to fulfill and do. It's something inside of us. It's the image of God. That's the law. It's his image and likeness, and it's by his spirit, it's by relationship with him that we be who we are. The whole human doing versus human being thing, right? The law is human doing. Grace is human being. You're just you. You're just the image of God. You're just naturally who you're supposed to be. So Jesus was going to restore that in this beautiful, better Kainos covenant. Um, It also promised that all will know him. And that's amazing because that right there is Jeremiah saying, like, you're not going to need this this outside mediator priest to do the work. Because all have my image in them. All can connect to me. All can hear my voice. This was the plan of God all along. And I want to bring you back to Genesis 15 right now because those two images of fire that, that, that walk through that bloody aisle, that's where God was, he was speaking into this even then. God declared he was going to make sure this happened. This, this restoration of our identity as his children, it was going to happen in spite of our unfaithfulness. And he was going to put us into a deep sleep. He was going to teach us to rest and trust him. In the new covenant, it also says, I will be merciful and I will remember their sins no more. So in this Kainos peace treaty, this totally upgraded, glorious, new kind of alliance relationship, God was also saying there is total mercy towards your unfaithfulness. I don't even remember your sins, he says. This is the sheer gift that he's given us. And how is it possible? How can he just not remember? How can he just not see our sins? Well, it's because both the father and the son walk down that that covenant aisle. The torch and the furnace together. The father walked down to fulfill his end of the agreement our end of the agreement 
was accomplished by Jesus who stood in our place. Jesus walked down that aisle representing us. And now when God sees us, he chooses to see his son his original image and likeness, which is really who we truly still are, but it's, we've been blinded by it. Jesus took our sins on himself. He bore them. He bore the weight of them. He was crushed. So he took all of that away. He took it all away for us. He took the punishment and the justice we felt we needed, actually. Hmm. So what's our call? Our call is to just be in awe of it. It's to be in a deep sleep and just behold it. Just receive it. In other words, in other words, come back to the place of trust in the goodness of your dad. In the goodness of the father. Just just trust. I gotta, I gotta open the chamber of secrets. God, God was always for us. God was always for us. God keeps no record of wrongs. He's not counting man's sins against them. What? It's true. Oh, it's going to get good. Oh. Paul. Paul called the gospel the mystery hidden for generations. It was always true, but it wasn't revealed until the coming, the appearing of Messiah Jesus. These are all in the notes, so you can all go ahead and read it. Argue with me later. From day one, God, God was not a punisher. The Apostle John wrote that in perfect love, there's no fear of punishment. You know what punishes us? Ourselves. We punish ourselves. We absolutely berate ourselves. We whip ourselves down out of guilt and shame. So much so that we had to devise systems with priests and animals and sacrifices in ancient days to handle the weight of the guilt that we feel for breaking covenant with such a beautiful, perfect creator and friend. We feel the sheer weight of that. Even if we can't articulate it, there's shame and we punish ourselves. And then the accuser comes in and he punishes us on top of it. The enemy punishes us. Our, our sins punish us. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are horrible consequences for walking off the cliff, away from grace, away from his love. But God is not a punisher. He's our friend and our father, and he's a savior who came not to condemn the world, but to save it. And he did this. This is, this is the hard thing to grasp for all you Bible readers out there. <laughs> he did this by first entering the fallen system 
that we set up in the Old Testament. He went with that for a season. Like Jesus bearing our sins on the cross, God bore our religion. But he was always planning on something better and greater. And you could see it even further back than Genesis 15. I'll remind you of this as well. Genesis 3. All the way in the garden. He didn't run from them. They transgressed. They violated the relationship. They sinned. And what happens? They hide. God goes after them. He searches for them. Oh, but he kicked them out of the garden. Guess what? He went with them. Yeah, he's right there with Cain and Abel talking to them. And before he did that, he clothes them with animal skins. And already he speaks to that guilt that had infected their soul and says, look, I am going to cover you one day. In fact, I'm going to clothe myself with human skin. <laughs> I'm gonna, and I'm going to take all this away from you. And you will never have to live under the guilt of this again. And all you need to do, take and eat. All you need to do is learn how to be loved. All you need to do is learn to grow in the trust of my goodness. We made priests, we made covenants and sacrifices. Jesus came as the priest, the covenant, and the sacrifice to end it all. That's the gospel. He's the guarantor of a kainos covenant. So I just pray right now that you all be put into a deep sleep like Father Abraham. <laughs> to behold the glory. The wonder of grace. <sighs> May your eyes be enlightened. May your eyes be enlightened today to see who your father is. who you are. May you be filled with revelation, wisdom, grace. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Oh, Denise, you had a word before about condemnation. Could you just share it very quickly and then I'd, I'd rather you just pray it, pray it out. But if you need to say something about it, go ahead first, but just receive this for a moment. Yeah, the Lord was uh, sp speaking to me during worship about people that have felt condemnation at such a deep level and um, they just aren't able to get rid of it. And I felt like the Lord was saying that he's breaking it. He's breaking it off of you. So if that speaks to you, but, you know, it's all the scriptures that Nick was saying. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, that his mercy triumphs judgment, that he's with us and for us all the time. And that just to walk back into that trust. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are releasing people of condemnation. People that have been in it so deep, Father, that they can't get out. Because they condemn themselves, Father. But you tell us you do not condemn us. That you love us. So we thank you, Father. We thank you for breaking it off of them. We thank you for the visions, for the dreams, 
that are coming, Father, for the people that are being set free today, Father, and tomorrow and the next day, Lord. We just thank you and we praise you for who you are, Father, for who you are, so loving, so kind, so merciful. We thank you that we can live again in the freedom, in the freedom, Lord, that you offer to walk with you and talk with you and be all that you want us to be, but all that you want us to be, Father, is, is truly all that we want to be as well, that we will become one with you, Father as we walk. Thank you, Lord. Yes, this is my friend Nancy. Many of you know her. Some of you know, some of you know me. How are you? Um, you know, I've had a breakthrough, and it ties right in with what everything you just taught. Um, and I did hear it from a teacher on television. But it, it's like, what am I, what's the call on my life? People, a lot of people are always saying, well, how do I know what the call is on my life? And I used to say, we're called to worship him, and if you worship him, he'll show you what to do. But then I got this, this revelation from a teacher on television. He said, the first thing you are called to is to let him love you. And, you know, I mean, that's how we got saved. He loved us first. That's how we got saved. So I'm like, just let him love you, and then you will automatically worship him, and then, you know, he'll have you go out and do whatever. But that whole first step, just let him love you, and that's exactly what you were teaching. Thank you, Nancy. That's good. Amen. Um, I, I just I want to open the communion table up again. I just feel like, I don't know, somebody might just need to have a second helping today. Or maybe you came in late and you didn't partake before.